to first start that expressing that uh, I have great respect for the people of Myanmar. And I, along with others of the international community, had every hope that uh, the situation in the country under Aung San Suu Kyi would be vastly different uh, from the past, but it is really not uh, that much different from the past. The government uh, is increasingly demonstrating that it has no interest and capacity in establishing a fully functioning democracy where all its people equally enjoy all their rights and freedom. It is not upholding justice and rule of law. The rule of law is an ideal that the state councillor repeatedly says is the standard to which all in Myanmar are held. However, I see that this is clearly not the case in reality. If the rule of law were upheld, all people in Myanmar, regardless of their position, would be answerable to fair laws that are impartially applied, the impunity would not reign, and the law would not be wielded as a weapon of oppression. There have been countless cases that demonstrate this fact, including under the NLD government, and there continue to be such cases against journalists, lawyers, and human rights defenders. Although uh, the Constitution vests uh, significant power in the military, uh, the civilian government can do a lot. However, they are either tacitly or explicitly choosing not to use this power. And I urge the state councillor to use all her moral and political power. On a regular basis, I receive reports of new charges lodged against lawyers and activists while exercising their legitimate rights and freedoms. And a point in case will be the two Reuters journalists, Walon and uh, Chosei Wu, and a lawyer, uh, Kin Kin Cha, uh, she and three other journalists from 11 Media, Nayin Min, uh, Jo Zo Lin, and Pyo Wei Win, and activist uh, Tin Cha. When very few people have access to Northern Rakhine, a certain individual has been granted access twice, including to Indin and to Latoli, where we've heard of the famous massacres that had occurred in Rakhine. He has created videos that echo the military narrative, which shockingly have been circulated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to UN agencies in Myanmar. I welcome the recent decision of the pre-trial chamber of the International Criminal Court. And as you all know, that the uh, Human Rights Council just established, through its resolution, a independent uh, mechanism. The establishment of this independent mechanism will be an interim step, and the international community must continue to work so that this mechanism can uh, be established in, this, uh, in the very shortest time as possible. Allegations to senior government officials committing acts of genocide against its own people is most serious. And if established, would amount to a violation of preemptory uh, norms of international law. Mil uh, Myanmar's lack of compliance with the Genocide Convention, although it is a state party to this convention, and a lack of adherence to obligations arising from international treaties and customary international law to investigate and prosecute allegations of crimes against humanity and war crimes must not be tolerated. Thank you, and I stop here. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Michelle Nichols with Reuters. Uh, on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thank you so much for doing this briefing today. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, obviously there is the UN Security Council briefing this afternoon. Um, many diplomats have told us we're expecting a, a procedural vote um, called by China to try and stop this briefing. Um, in your report, you have called for the Council to impose an arms embargo, targeted sanctions, but as we're likely to see this afternoon, the Council's quite divided on this issue. So what's your sort of message to them on that front? Have either of you met with the Chinese delegation while you've been 
here in New York, um, and what's your message to them? Thank you for those uh, questions. Um, I have engaged with the Chinese in the past. This time, I have sent a letter for requesting a meeting and numerous uh, emails and numerous requests for a meeting. They have not even acknowledged receiving those e requests and not even a, a, a yes or a no. Uh, and I'd like to uh, add on to what uh, Mr. Darusman uh, has said about the uh, accountability mechanism. Uh, what we're hoping for is the referral to the ICC and also maybe the next option if the ICC fails then an ad hoc international tribunal. But at the same time what I'm also calling for is for member states of the Rome Statute to uh, refer this to the ICC themselves or also any country can exercise universal jurisdiction. Uh, and so I think this is now is the time where the onus is on the uh, international community, and more so the onus is in the Security Council if they're there actually to really um, adhere to the Charter of the United Nations. And this would be a, a test to the work of the Security Council. Um, I've, I've heard it being said that the past determines the present and the pre present presents itself with choices that will determine the future. And I think we are at a point where Myanmar and the international community both are at this juncture at uh, the right choice to make that will determine the future of not only Myanmar, but for the world's peace and security of the region and the world. Um, Myanmar continuously says that there are no quick fixes. Because of this slow to address, we've had we've seen years of persecution, years of crimes against humanity unfolding in Myanmar. And now the same narrative is there that there are no quick fixes. And I would say that you need to quickly respond, otherwise, then there will be more uh, things that will slip, and the people, the people at the end of Myanmar, all people will suffer in the future. Thank you. Uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that there are steps that the uh, civil authorities could take, in addition to just expressing uh, the moral authority and their outrage at what's happening, but. Uh, could you be a little bit more specific on the concrete uh, political steps that the civil government can take, given the fact that the military has so much power under the Constitution there? You mean the civil uh, government in, in Myanmar? In Myanmar? Yes, in Myanmar. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Maybe the, 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 the civil arm of, of the hybrid government there. In the the, the, yeah, the, they're... Um, the state there, are, there are certain uh, powers delegated, I, I believe, to the civil authorities. Uh, the military is predominant. Um, Rapporteur mentioned that she suggested that they be specific steps that the civil side take on the issue of the Rohingyas. And I want to get more details on what those might be. I thank you for that question. Um, when the NLD-led government uh, came into power. Uh, I had given the uh, state councillor a list of benchmarks. And within that list, I have also presented to her 200-some laws uh, that could be, that must be uh, amended, repealed, or uh, rescinded. Okay. And new laws need to be acted. Now, the old uh, colonial oppressive laws, they need to be repealed. And what, if they're still in the books, then it's used against the civilian population. And for instance, like Wallone's case, the Official Secrets Act, it, go, it dates back 100 years in the colonial times. And as long as it's, it's still in the books, they've used it uh, to, um, to um, uh, arrest and charge the two lawyers. Now, um, so once these, the civilian government has the power 
to do the legislative reform. And uh, it's not being done. It's, uh, the, and the new enactment of laws, um, it, it's very slow when it's protection of the civilians. But new laws that, are, uh, that can actually, or amendments to laws that can actually oppress civilians are very quick to be passed. And that is what I meant, that there are steps that the, the civilian government has a lot of power to do. And I presented the list to the um, Legal Affairs Committee, Shui Man, um, two years ago. Thank you. Uh, hello, Ms. Lee. Uh, Suman Ali, La Voce de New York. I wanted to know if you have any message for President Mint, since he has the power to pardon the journalists that are being imprisoned right now. I would certainly think that he does have the power, uh, because, uh, the presidential power, and I think he should use this power uh, to, for those two journalists, and not just for those two journalists, but others too, okay? Uh, others who, for instance, Kin Kin Cha, uh, a lawyer who's been uh, at, uh, defending the students. If you remember the 2015 uh, student-led uh, demonstrations against the uh, education policy, and uh, now she's in Tarawadi prison, okay? Um, wh when lawyers uh, who are, who defend sensitive cases, they're put in prison and they're charged with uh, cases, with uh, old laws, for instance, the penal code, or, or mostly now in uh, the, uh, when there's a, a section 66D, okay? And I, I just saw that the president had, had a message on the UN Day uh, today. Actually, today is uh, the UN Day, I believe. And I think as a gesture, he could pardon, and as a gesture for, and he had a, he, he presented two or three pages of a statement for the celebrating the UN Day, and I think as another uh, first step, incremental step, would be to allow access to my mandate and to the fact-finding mission and unhindered access to other uh, UN uh, humanitarian uh, actors. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Lee. Um, a question for you from your initial statement that you had seen really no changes at all. Um, I assume this would mean that you would oppose the return to Myanmar under the current circumstances of all of the Rohingya who have fled to Bangladesh. And um, what do you make of the comments that the government has said about all of the progress and things that they have been doing since last year. Um, Mr. Dorosman, you talked about um, the state of the uh, Rohingya who are left in Rakhine and you used the words about an ongoing genocide. I wonder if you could explain or give some details about what you know about this ongoing genocide. Thank you. Thank you very much. In reference to your question about any um, progress uh, made uh, in, uh, I think, in uh, Myanmar as a whole, yeah. Yeah, I don't think there, there's been a lot of progress in, in terms of um, economic development and infrastructure. But in the area of uh, democratic space and uh, people's right to uh, to claim back their land that was uh, confiscated or evicted, that has, that nothing has um, developed. There's no progress in that. Conducive conditions. Uh, Myanmar, uh, the repatriation is not possible now. The, the conducive, unless the, con the situation in Myanmar is conducive, there will, I, I will, will not, uh, I will not encourage any repatriation. Conducive conditions means that they should not go back to the existing laws, policies, and practices that are existing there, the oppressive laws, the discrimination. All they need is, the minimum is what they need is 
freedom of movement, access to basic health services. Right now, the situation in Myanmar is such that um, it's like an apartheid situation condition where uh, people in, who are living in, uh, who are Rohingyas left in Myanmar are still facing problems. They have no freedom of movement. Uh, the, the camps, the shelters, the model villages that are being built, it's more of a cementing of a, uh, a total segregation uh, from or separation from the Rakhine ethnic community and the Rohingya community. And uh, recently, you may be aware that Wura Tu was in Sitwe, had a firebrand Wura Tu had a big um, event there. And he had said that once the UN identi uh, refers the Myanmar to ICC, he will pick up a gun. And uh, he was the one that uh, threatened to, you know, to throw uh, for uh, members of his country's patriots to uh, stand up and rise and teach this beastly woman a lesson to me. And at that same time, an old, uh, a, real, a real activist, Chin Chaw, was standing there with a sign, uh, referral to ICC. Now, this man was now put back in jail under penal code 505 and will, it was facing another six months jail sentence. So in, in these conditions, people cannot go back. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to keep you waiting. Um, San Suu Kyi, a lot of attention has been paid for her over decades. Do you think she's in total denial on the state of the Rohingya, or that, and just says a few things so that she looks like she's part of the uh, international community. Because uh, I remember her first speech a few months ago about this, where she did not recognize their plight. Is she still in, is she in total denial, or is she trying to balance herself out with the military? Well, thank you. I think she is in total denial. She chooses not to recognize it. When I met her, I told her, I requested that she needs to go to visit Rakhine and see, and I even said I'm willing to show you the pictures that I have. And she, her response was, no, I don't need to. My ministers know what they're doing. They do their job well. Um, she did say in, uh, in Hanoi uh, that uh, there could be something that could have been done differently in Rakhine. But then recently, when she was in uh, Japan, uh, when one of the, the interviewer asked her this, and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I never said that. Um, so, you know, you, it, that's an indication of absolute denial, I think. Because if, had she had not said that, I don't know what you're referring to. I never said that. Where did you get that information? But it's, you know, it's all over the place, what she had said in Hanoi. And we thought that maybe there was a little... Um, glimmer of hope. Um, the one thing that the one of the reasons why they can't go back, or the people who are in Myanmar are still facing the genocidal um, uh, conditions, is remember a few years ago when the four religious packages laws were um, enacted, um, but the marriage law, the Buddhist, uh, and the conversion law. One of the laws is to with the birth spacing is uh, they had for Rakhine that you cannot have children. The birth spacing has to be 36 months. And uh, more than two kids uh, will not, their uh, families with more than two kids, the children are blacklisted. And birth registration for Rohingya families is not a possibility. So they're not even, re they're not recognized as a child. They're not recognized as potential member of the society because of the birth spacing of 36 months. Now, I, I'd like to, before we close, I'd like to bring uh, to your attention something that completely flew out of the radar of the international community. We heard about the killings in 2016, October, 
when about 75,000, 80,000 people had fled to Cox's Bazaar after the ARSA attacked three border guard, police guard posts. But in 2012, there was an incident, October. This was after the riots and the killings of in, in June. October in, in Chokpu, this is now a, a economic place. Chokpu, there was, there, there was a 18, about 18 Rohingya ho homes that were burnt. There are no Rohingyas <laughs> left. There are no Rohingyas living in Chokpu because they were all killed then driven by the, um, we don't, by the community. They were driven out to the sea. The remaining who chose to stay at home were killed uh, by the machetes, uh, locked in their houses, and totally burnt. And f from reflections from those who took part in this incident, they reflect that the people were killed in the thousands, maybe to about a 10,000. Like, I believe about 10,000 because 18 homes disappeared from the face of Chokpu. So you, you see that these things have been going on even when it was out of the radar. And if it hadn't been for the fact-finding mission and, uh, and then this big scale, I think the military thought that they could get away from the small scales of things, and so they could get away with a big scale. But I think it, it got over uh, what they expected. The people fleeing from uh, Rakhine was much more than they had expected. I 